Mr. Davis, you again, you do have an opportunity to speak at this hearing, so you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, first and foremost, I want to say that I have hurt and disappointed and caused pain for all the people out there who are most in the world. Uh, since I began serious therapy about nine months ago, I've learned that I've done something that I had no intention of ever doing, something terrible. I have actually victimized children by looking at these images. I didn't realize at the time, but I definitely realize it now. I've also victimized my wife, my kids, my family, friends and all the good people of Central Ohio who have trusted me to go over her videos on television and so on. I'm very sorry for all that. I have been in intense therapy for almost nine months, going at least twice a week, uh, sometimes more than that. I have a psychiatrist as well, and I have a new line of therapy that I've just discovered as well that works on um, making sure that your recovery is solid, so I'm working on that as well. Um, I would like to say that internet pornography is a very dangerous gateway. Also, a seriously under um, undertreated addiction. Child pornography, of course, is far worse. What it really is, I have learned, is child sexual abuse images, and that's something that you can find them anywhere. There are countless victims, and now understanding the gravity of what I've done, I feel terrible about that. Um, I have no excuse for compulsively collecting the images. Uh, I, it was just something I did, um, and I'm ashamed of having done it. Do the parties stipulate to two days of jail time credit? Yes, Judge. Yes. Thank you. All right. Just so um, we are clear, um, I've reviewed a number of things in regarding to consideration of the proper sentence in this matter. And not only have I reviewed the purposes and principles of sentencing that is provided in Revised Code 2929.11, I have also reviewed uh, defense's motion to screen the defendant for admission to CDCF River City that was filed on January 23rd of 2020. I have reviewed the sentencing memorandum of defense um, <clears throat> with its attachments that was filed on March 13th of 2020. I have reviewed the sentencing memorandum of the state that was filed on March 18th of 2020. I have also reviewed the updated and amended uh, addendum, excuse me, to the sentencing memorandum by defense with supplemental records that was filed on um, May 20th of 2020. I've reviewed the PSI. I have reviewed the stop assessment. I have reviewed the mental health and mental um, medical and the medical records that were supplied. I have also reviewed all the letters from friends and family. And um, considering um, I did order at the request of defense a screen uh, for River City CDCF and the defendant was found acceptable to that program. There are numerous things that I find gravely concerning in this case. Um, to start with, Mr. Davis, you groomed your family and your coworkers to allow you to engage in a sex offense for seven years and go undetected. You groomed them and you constructed an environment that allowed you to sexually offend at work and at home for a period of seven years. Somehow you arranged for the time to engage in the behavior, but also you somehow groomed your family and your coworkers to not look at any of the devices you were using to view the pornography 
to child pornography and the abuse of children. The facts of the case are horrendous. Um, the number of the images is less concerning than the amount of time that you engaged in the behavior. The fact that the children were as young as four to up to the age of teenagers, that the images displayed children in sexual positions, pornography, and the female children were engaging in extremely graphic sexual activity to include child bondage. I will refrain from providing any additional information about the nature of the images. These are victims who were groomed and abused for years to get them to participate in these acts. You chose to support an industry that re-victimized these children over and over for years. Um, I have some concerns about even though your counsel just said you followed all the rules of um, bond, I disagree with that. Um, your attorney in his supplemental motion mentioned that you took place in counseling during the pandemic via telehealth. Please describe to the court exactly how you did that, not what you talked about, but how did that actually happen? Twice a week, I had an appointment with my therapist and she would call at a designated time and make an appointment just like we would have had I gone to her office and then we would converse for an hour, just like, except the only difference is it wasn't face to face. So we would do it, I would generally, because she had trouble hearing me where I was staying, I would get in my car, go to an empty mall parking lot because there was no one around, um, the mall was closed, and I would sit there and talk to her for an hour just as if I had gone to her office. So via telephone or via telephone? probation officer check your phone you do have access to the internet on that phone and you have been on the internet on that phone hmm. not for any inappropriate purpose I did bump into sir? one time I tried to sir oh sir sorry. it's my turn to talk sorry and you're gonna remain silent unless I specifically ask you a question that you need to respond to okay I'm sorry you were on the internet looking at walking your bond condition said no internet access period, not inappropriate access. It says no internet access, period. Another issue with your bond conditions is this. When you were, when you pled, I asked you to state your current residence address. At that time, you gave me your home that you were living in at the time of the arrest. And then when you were interviewed by the PSI writer, you did admit that you weren't staying there that you had to stay in a hotel. It is your responsibility as a condition of bond for the court to know your physical residing address at all times. So that's two conditions of bond that you were ignoring. That doesn't bode well in that if you don't follow the conditions of bond, how do I know whether or not you're gonna follow the conditions of probation if you were placed on probation? Now I'm gonna move on. I reviewed the PSI. The things that concern me out of the PSI are as follows. You engaged in the illegal behavior for seven years. You did not attempt to get any help whatsoever until you were arrested. You consistently mim minimize your actions. You acknowledge that there are a number of images, yet as the state has brought out and even in your PSI when you're being interviewed, you refer to the children as it, and you compare the collection of offensive, illegal pornography of the abuse and repeated abuse of children to the same as toys, comic books, and wine. It is, the, um, it is quite disturbing to me that you would compare the abuse of children to any type of object. And this is the worst type of sexual abuse that's videotaped and recorded and pictures are taken because it's children, children as young as four. You engaged in the behavior that supports an industry that repeatedly victimizes children. And 
through this whole period and everything that was submitted to the court and everything you said to the PSI writer, your concern is for yourself. And until today, when you came in front of me, you never once voiced a concern about the children. You have a series of critical thinking errors and beliefs to include denial, justification, minimization, victim stancing, and lack of victim empathy. You refer to children as it, dehumanizing and objectifying your victim, which only leads to an impulse to re-victimize. Children do not willingly engage in any type of sexual behavior. They have been groomed and they are abused into performing. Each one of the victims that you spent re-victimizing for a period of seven years. I do not find the claim that you were unaware of what, that what you were doing was a crime or illegal to be credible whatsoever because you hid it, you did it in private, or you would have been caught a lot sooner. You are a well-educated man who had a career in the public eye. You cannot claim that with your exposure to television that you were not aware of the human trafficking and the sex abuse problems that plague this society. In regard to defense counsel's motion and memorandum, in your original sentencing memorandum, you make arguments as to your opinion that the defendant changed, and I quote, changed his plea to guilty to, to charges that weren't actually meant what the law was trying to stop. It is wrong to change your plea to guilty and then argue in defense of pleading guilty and in mitigation that you didn't really do what the law said you did. If you didn't do it, then you have a trial and you let a jury or a judge determine whether the state has managed to achieve re beyond a reasonable doubt that you are guilty of something. There is repeated reference to um, Mr. Davis having suffered from numerous mental health issues for years. However, most of what is reported has been self-reporting and nothing has been substantiated by mental health records. The only records, mental health records that the court has to review are the ones that, for the treatment that was received after the defendant was arrested and indicted. Nothing substantiates the claim that you were ever treated for mental health prior to this arrest. It is not surprising that once you were arrested on a felony sentence in which prison is presumed that you develop anxiety and depression. Anyone sitting in jail thinking about going to prison is going to have anxiety and depression. Council has submitted to the court statements like, since his arrest, Mr. Davis has engaged fully and genuinely in intensive behavioral therapy. The court finds that statement to be misleading. I don't doubt that Mr. Davis has engaged in therapy to deal with his depression and anxiety, but nothing in the records I was provided shows that Mr. Davis engaged in any type of sex offender treatment, that there was any work done to control um, impulse issues, There is nothing in the records that demonstrate that you have been working on your pedophile tendencies and behaviors. The fact that in your most recent records it indicates that you were indulging in alcohol and indulging in overeating shows that nothing's been done for impulse control. And without impulse control, there's no way this court can feel comfortable that someone will not reoffend. There is discussion in the records as to um, Mr. Davis being a sex addict. 
However, there is a distinction between being a sex addict and being a pedophile and viewing child pornography. Those do not go together necessarily. There is no research that provides sex addiction is akin to pedoph pedophilia. They're two completely different issues. And there's been no therapy regarding either. Nothing in the records indicate that you have been working on either of these issues. Again, everything that I have received indicates that you have been focused on your depression and your anxiety. Now, the defense had submitted a report from Dr. Brahms. Dr. Julie Brahms was retained to conduct a psychological evaluation and to provide a written report to the court. The court has reviewed this report. However, Dr. Brahms was not retained to perform a formal assessment or actuarial risk. Her work must be discounted because of this. Simply, she was not retained to perform a sex offender assessment, meaning that based on what she was asked to do, there were no sex offender test scores or specific measures used in her conclusions. She did not apply any of the standardized tools for evaluation of sex offenders for reoffending or rehabilitation. Without applying any standardized tools while doing an assessment, it's impossible to determine whether someone's amenable to rehabilitation. By comparison, to make it very simple, if I went to the doctor and I told the doctor, I think I have high blood pressure, and the doctor talked to me and looked at me and said, you don't have high blood pressure. Without using the standardized tools to check my blood pressure, a diagnosis means nothing. Let's, and I want, I want it to be clear, Dr. Abrams did what she was asked to do. I had probation reach out to her, ask additional questions after we received her report, and she did confirm everything I just said. Unfortunately, I can put no value in what she said because she did not assess you in a way that would be helpful to the court. I reviewed the mental health records, and again, self-reporting of a lifetime of mental health issues doesn't help me when and a simple example is, if you were a drug addict and you came before me and you told me, I went to six months of inpatient rehab, I've been clean for 12 months, I'm over this problem, yet you provided me no records, I would not be able to consider that in the proper sentencing because I don't have anything to see to show that this has been a lifetime problem. Counsel indicates that you are dedicated to making sure that your counseling will help you with preventing any type of reoffending. However, the records also indicate that you have indulged in alcohol and you have now developed an overeating habit. Each prescription you are on indicates that they have a warning that you should not consume alcohol whatsoever while you are taking the prescribed medication. This also demonstrates to the court that there's been no progress on your impulse control. Nothing this court has reviewed indicates that you have taken one step towards rehabilitation or preventing reoffending. Mr. Sherman, in your motion, you state, actions speak louder than words. You're absolutely right, they do. In mitigation, I have heard since the beginning of this how much you have lost. You lost your job, you lost your position in society, you have lost your home in Arlington, you have ruined, it has ruined your family. Um, I don't doubt that you have suffered embarrassment and humiliation and that you have fallen from this position in society that people rarely have. However, all that rests solely on your shoulders 
as a result of your own actions that you took part in for seven years. Any shame, vilification, or any being shunned by your friends and your coworkers, that's all on you and it's a direct result of what your behavior was for seven years. The law does not take into consideration your fall from grace when determining the appropriate sentence. And to make it simple, if it did, you deserve a lighter sentence because you had so much to lose, whereas if you were just some poor unemployed guy looking at child porn, you should, he, should go to, he or she should go to prison because she didn't suffer the loss of her job and her life. That's not, that's not how sentencing works. Are we holding you up, Mr. Sherman? No, I'm not. Only viewing the images and not touching the child does not go to mitigation for what you're charged with. You are only charged with viewing images. You're not charged with touching a child. So we're not going to compare your set, what's the appropriate sentence is to someone who actually molested a child. And I have reviewed the letters from family and friends, and you are very fortunate to have so many friends and family, and I have taken everything into consideration in regard to that. And just as a reminder, as we discussed, um, the sentencing is different than usual in this case. If you recall, counts one, two, and four will have a set sentence, but due to the nature of count three and when it, the date was, it requires an indefinite sentencing range. The following is a sentence going, that is going to be imposed on the court by this court. Count one, the pandering sexually oriented matter involving a minor as a felony of the second degree receives a sentence of four years. Count two, pandering sexually oriented matter involving a minor as a felony of the second degree is also a four year sentence. Count three, pandering sexually oriented matters involving a minor as an F2 with an indefinite sentence. So that sentence has a minimum sentence of four years and up to six years. Count four, pandering sexually oriented matter involving a minor as a felony of the fourth degree is a sentence of 12 months. All counts will run concurrent to one another. So the total sentence will be four years minimum and up to six years for the indefinite portion of that sentence. Costs will be imposed, fines will be waived. At this time, I must remind you of post-release control. As a sex offender, you will be required to serve, if you serve your prison sentence, to be on post-release control for five years. That means the adult parole authority has the ability to send you back to prison in increments of nine months for each violation of your post-release control for up to half of your minimum term of your incarceration. We must also review the registration requirements. My understanding is you've filled out the form already, but let's go over it. So you will be required to report as a tier two offender, which means you will be required to register for 25 years every 180 days. I have the form in front of me. Did you read and review this form with your attorney before you signed it? And is that, is that your signature on line 11? Now, do you understand that you'll be required to register your residence, your place of employment, and any schools that you attend? Yes. And do you understand that you will have to report to the sheriff's department in the county that you establish residency? Yes. And do you understand that you'll be required to go to the sheriff's department in advance if you intend to move or change either your work or your um, schooling? And do you understand that if you fail to register as required, that that can lead to additional charges? Yes. Thank you. We have two days of jail time credit. Is there anything else from the state? No, sir. Is there anything else from defense? Would the court consider delaying execution of the sentence until the prison system releases control over the COVID-19 virus? As a dispatch report, I think yesterday they did a one in 10 in 
First of all, I didn't take it the wrong way. I took it just like you wrote it. Um, and no, that was nothing that you said was um, taken into consideration in regard to applying the purposes and principles of uh, 2929 um, 11. In regard to allowing a later report date, does the state have a position? Uh, Judge, I generally do not like report dates. I think that it's best that a defendant go straight from the courtroom to the jail. Um, that way there's no confusion about when and where he has to report. And it also ensures that the court the court sentence is indeed carried out. Um, we all know that defendants fail to show up at court sometimes, and I would hate um, for the court sentence to then um, not be able to be enforced because Mr. Davis doesn't show up. Um, additionally, Governor, Governor DeWine has issued um, certain guidance uh, for us in dealing with judicial release hearings, and I think that this um, would help in this case. Um, the court, or Governor DeWine, has uh, stated that anyone with a sex offense or violent offenders should remain in jail. Um, this is a sex offense, and so uh, it's the state's position that he should be taken into custody today. Thank you. Um, at this time, the defendant will be taken into custody, um, and the sentence will be imposed immediately. Thank you. Anything else from the state? No, Anything else from defense? No,